Tuesday, March 19, 2024, the committee of the whole meeting. Um, first item is call to order and roll call. So I just called the order. What's our roll call? Trustee Hallwax here. Trustee Listener here. Trustee Mialopoulos here. Trustee Underdog here. Trustee Rubin here. Trustee Scott here. President Rowan here. Um, we are not live streaming this meeting tonight, but the video recording will be available on the Village's YouTube channel. The first item on the agenda is public comment. This portion of the meeting allows for those in attendance to address the board regarding non-agenda items. I'll ask for public comments to relate to the agenda, which is home rule, to be provided when we reach, reach that item on the agenda. All comments are limited to three minutes. I'll notify the speaker when the time is up. We, did, we have uh, established a total time limit for public comment. Let me just say, uh, we've seen um, uh, some a, a letter inviting folks to come to the meeting to talk about something that's not on the agenda. Totally okay. Um, but this is a, we have, this is a special committee meeting. We're talking about one subject and one subject only. So if you raise a subject that's different than that, we're not going to be making any decisions. We're not going to consider it. We're probably not going to talk about it. I will add that we do have a regular village board meeting on Thursday night with a regular public comment. Can't promise we're making any decisions on non-agenda items then either, but the regular village board meetings are upstairs so there's more room and the regular village board meetings are live stream so with that uh is there anybody that wants to take their three minutes and talk about a non-agenda i will mr. mr mendoza yes so thank you and i i know that there is a different agenda tonight um you know the community was made aware today of an advertisement for a dei uh, liaison in partnership with Helen Park uh, and Will Matt. And so, you know, I know uh, Hillary is the chairperson of that committee uh, and is also on city council. You know, I've, I've done my best over a couple of years uh, to show up and to be civil and to try to raise a different side, believing DEI leads to division uh, and leads to more racism and it inevitably leads to anti-Semitism. So for years, I've been making this comment and it's gone on deaf ears, you know, believing this committee perhaps might allow diversity of thought, intellectual diversity, but never happens. And what we've seen over the last couple of months, especially since October, is further escalation in anti-Semitism. New Trier just recently canceled its Holocaust Remembrance Day in the name of DEI. It's the DEI committee that canceled it. The bookstall, they, they canceled their Jewish speaker. So the things that were predicted to happen are happening. And the fact that our town is spending my taxpayer dollars, other taxpayer dollars on a DEI consultant only to further this kind of viewpoint to me is atrocious. You know, I happen to be of Mexican descent. I think that's what this committee is looking for, but it's really not. It's not really looking for diversity. It's looking for an echo chamber to advance an ideology. I understand that tonight's meeting is about something else, but you will chatter in the hallway and you'll chatter prior to your council meeting on Thursday. And when you do, I hope you halt that, that job application and any funding that goes along with it. We've gone too far. Anti-Semitism is rearing its ugly head once again. And it's a shame that Glencoe would participate in advancing that ideology. Thank you. So, and I am Juan Alzate. Uh, I live in the, my name is Juan Alzate. I live in Glencoe uh, for the last 14 years. And uh, I'm a diversity probably the only one here. I'm from Colombia. My wife is Canadian. He's a foreign New Jordan in, in Glencoe. 
diversity in the way that you see in a Latin country exists. And it's, I am 30% Native American, actually, 10% Ashkenazi, 50% European. I am Jewish too. And I see when I was in my country, we never had any discussions about diversity and inclusion because it was not needed. Only when I came to this country, I started to see the ugly part of diversity and inclusion, especially in the last six years. And my kids are Jewish, and they are seen already in Nutria and here, the ugliness of the diversity inclusion. That's the point is to create open dialogue parties and the other parties really closing the doors to the, big, the smallest minority that the Jewish minority that my kids are, and they are Latinos. My daughter has, the best friends are a Jewish, the other is an Indian kid, the other kid is a Japanese, and the other is a Muslim from his father from Gaza. They are in the diversity. I feel we are in a, doing a great job in our town in the way that we are doing it. Getting money to spend in another person to come and tell us what to do, I don't I think it's a waste of value. Thank you. Okay. Anybody else? Awesome. So I'm Ilya Boritsky. Um, I also have serious reservations about us spending money on this. First, I'm a taxpayer. This is not a use of capital. And two, the backdrop of DEI really starts putting, if you really research this, it does put people into buckets based on the way they're born and based on their race. And that's really not what we should be doing. We should be really thinking about looking at people with meritocracy. If you look at what's already happening in Trier, we've already seen, to Mark's point, anti-Semitism as we put people in between oppressors, the press seats. And this is my ideology. I really don't want to fund with my taxpayer money. Okay, anybody else? Okay, uh, I, I, let me say something briefly about what the village sort of has and hasn't done. Um, we do not have a EI committee. We have something called Council for Inclusion and Community. Um, I, I'm not positive what DEI is. It's defined a lot of different ways. However it's defined, it isn't what the Council for Inclusion and Community does. Second thing I want to say is the village board uh, hadn't done anything. Um, we were approached by uh, an, another one of our North Shore communities, and they said, if, you know, if we got in as part of a group, we might be able to spend less on a consultant who could advise us about some stuff we could do sort of internally with our staff to make sure that we were not discriminating. Uh, we said, well, okay. And so there's a, a, a RFP was put out. We haven't spent a dime. We haven't gotten any response to the RFP. I don't know what we're going to do when we get a response to the RFP, whether we're going to sign up or not. It might depend on what they're going to do and how much they're going to cost. So at this juncture, the village hasn't done anything. Um, so I don't think anybody needs to worry. I am confident the village is not. Uh, we're doing our best not to be racist. We're doing our best not to be anti-Semitic. Um, I don't think we're either. Uh, and lastly, I want to say, because I saw the communication that was sent around and invited people to come here, they were told that there was one culprit on the village board who's responsible for all of this. I just want to assure you that is not true. The village has, has done anything. And this item that's listed as a possible thing in our budget had nothing to do with Council for Inclusion of Community, which was consulted. So, um, okay. That's all I have to say on this because I want to get to what we want to talk about. Thank you for coming in. Uh, we're always happy to hear from our residents. We take all of our residents seriously. We do. Um, and if you want to try to say this again at our public meeting, it's going to be televised. Come on on Thursday. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, the next item on the agenda is a discussion of village government structures regarding home rule. Um, and I'll ask our deputy village manager, Nikki Larson, and the village attorney, Steve Allrod, Steve Weiss, to educate us on home rule. 
All right, are we ready? So, good evening. Uh, get around so I can see everybody. Good. Hi there. I'm listening. Um, this is going to get professorial because um, I'm starting with a little lecture, uh, a, a, a classroom lecture on, on the, the legal status in Glencoe and home rule. Some of you have heard this before, but don't rely on your past memory. I've spiced it up a little bit tonight. <laughs> um, and uh, there's only so much you can do with the subject matter. So um, I just want to start with reminding everybody what is Glencoe. So we Glencoe is an Illinois municipal corporation. We're governed by two legal documents. The first is our special charter that was created by the state legislature that actually incorporated the village of Glencoe back in 1869. And then many years later, we, meaning you or your predecessors, adopted the uh, Glencoe Village Code, um, which was the, uh, which is your code of ordinances. So those two documents, the, the uh, charter, well, the charter was adopted in 69, not the incorporation. So those two documents together are our body of laws. Now, the charter hasn't changed since 1869. Um, it was thought at the time that communities that have a special charter, and the word special meant special, there aren't a lot of them. Winnetka's one, but very few others on the North Shore. The communities that, that were created with a special charter had special laws, somewhat more liberal laws than other um, communities in the state of Illinois. The problem with it that was great in 1869, um, there's been a lot of change in the world since then. And those special laws, um, such as um, kicking up gravel, on the public right of way is uh, don't don't make a whole lot of sense any longer. The charter is not something that we rely on on a day to day basis. Our code of ordinances, however, is and our code of ordinances are are, are gets amended from time to time by you all. You've adopted amendments to that code, and that's a living, breathing document. Our operational form is twofold. We are governed by what is called the Article 3, 3, really 3.1 form of government. It's called the Mayor Council form, although we have a President Trustee form. Um, that is where you have a village president who is the chief executive officer of the village and a board, all elected at large. We don't have uh, wards in, in the village. Um, and at least technically by statute, the village president is in charge of the not only the executive role, but also the administrative role, the day-to-day -day, um, operation of the village. However, Glencoe was one of the first communities in the country, certainly in the state, to create what is known as a manager or a village manager or a managerial form, but it did so by ordinance. What the village board did was delegate to the office of village manager all of the powers that the village president has in hiring um, and, 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 and terminating personnel, in operating the village on a day-to-day -day basis. In, in towns that have not done that, the mayor or the village president retains that authority. In Glencoe, it's been delegated to the village manager. Now, here's just an important point. Glencoe did delegate it to the village manager, but only by ordinance. That means that that power can be retracted or repealed by ordinance. It's called, it requires four votes, a majority of the board. Um, other towns, such as uh, Highland Park and Northbrook, two of our bordering communities, adopted the managerial form by referendum. And they're known as an Article 5 statutory managerial form. That, that gives the manager in those towns the inherent power to do what our manager does by ordinance. The village, the city council or village board in those towns cannot take it away. 
Glencoe still could adopt the managerial form by statute. <laughs> this form has worked well to date, but I'm just giving you that distinction. So we are an Article Three um, mayor council form, uh, managerial by ordinance, and then uh, the reason that we're here today, we are currently non-home rule. So <clears throat> what is home rule? And here's where I'm gonna sort of bring to you a little bit from, um, I think many of you know this, I teach uh, municipal law in uh, at Northwestern Law School. I took over, <clears throat> many of you may remember, Don Clark Netsch, who was actually one of the pioneers of the home rule provision of the Illinois Constitution. She was my municipal law professor many, many decades ago, and she invited me to co-teach with her for a number of years, and I've now taken over her class. Um, we always started with the, the case Hunter versus Pittsburgh. It's a 1907 case, which basically said that local governments are creatures of the state, that um, the, 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 the state can do whatever it wants with local governments, each state can. Illinois uh, desire to create lots and lots and lots of local governments, more than any other state in the country. Um, but it, it, it governed how, it, it provided up for how local governments can operate. And for many years, local governments operated under what was known as Dillon's Rule. And you've seen that in some of our memos, Dillon's Rule. Just gonna give you a little explanation of what that is. Dillon is actually John Forrest Dillon. He was a justice on the Iowa Supreme Court in 1900. And he was a, what we now know today as a, what we would call today as a strict constructionist. He is, if it's not written that way in the constitution or in the statute, it can't be done. You must look to the statute. If it's there, you can do it. If it's not there, don't even try to, um, don't even think about it. Uh, and he believed that local governments can only do what the state legislature has written in what, what is now known as the Illinois Municipal Code, the state statutes that govern all the municipalities. So if a municipality wanted to um, have a, a certain way to hire police officers, they would have to go to the Illinois Municipal Code and see if there's authority. And if there wasn't, get the state legislature to change it. If the municipality wanted to adopt elevator laws or real estate broker laws or automobile laws or restrictions. It would could only do it if there was precedent for it or, or a provision for it in the state statute. Um, as many towns grew and grew differently in Illinois, that became a little bit cumbersome. A town like Chicago had very different needs than all other towns, yet until 1970, Chicago was governed by this Dillon's rule, just like Glencoe was. And every time Chicago needed to do something or had, had, a, had, had a need for a certain law, it had to go or send its legislators down to Springfield and get a law to um, allow it to function in what or adopt a tax, adopt a license, adopt regulation, adopt the law, only if the state legislature allowed it. Well, in the 1960s, um, you'll recall that Chicago was led by uh, a mayor by the name of Richard J. Daly. Mm -hmm. He found it very burdensome to have to go down to Springfield every time he wanted to change the law. And um, he became a big, big proponent of home rule. Um, a lot of the downstate communities, which at that time meant everything other than the city of Chicago, even Glencoe would have been a downstate Thanks. community, um, opposed of the concept of home rule. Uh, many other states in the country had a concept of home rule that would allow some communities, uh, if, based on certain qualification standards, to become home rule. Illinois did not. On the other hand, um, you had a bunch of downstate farmers and, and <clears throat> business people who felt in, um, that the state was in need of a new constitution. Illinois, uh, the last constitution in Illinois was adopted in 1870. So downstaters were pushing for a new constitution that would have um, new governance um, throughout the state, different electoral uh, provisions, uh, better representation for uh, the, the downstate, uh, downstate legislators, all would be built into a state constitution. Um, 
and believe it or not, uh, gun rights would be built into the Illinois state constitution. So there was a big push to get a constitutional convention and change the state constitution. <clears throat> Mayor Daley, who held a lot of cards because there were a lot of legislators that were beholden to him, said, all right, I'll agree to a state new state constitution. I'll agree to revise the Illinois constitution, but only if there is a home rule provision in it. And that battle was joined at what was called CONCON -Con of 1970, the Constitutional Convention. And at that Constitutional Convention, there was a new constitution that ultimately was voted on and approved by the voters. <laughs> and it did include Article 7, Section 6, which was a home rule concept for the state of Illinois. Um, and in that constitutional provision, and this is what home rule is, um, it, certain towns were allowed mm -hmm. to become home rule automatically in 1970. If you had a population of 25,000 or more, you automatically became home rule. Others could only do it by referendum. So on day one, um, many, many towns, I don't have the exact, I, I think 50, um, uh, qualified for home rule by population. And here's what it is. That, so that's my history lesson. Now here's here's a little bit then, uh, of, of, of what home rule is. Article seven, section six, next slide, um, provides, and it's a very liberal home rule um, constitutional provision, much more so than many other states. It basically says that unless it's limited by the constitutional provision, home rule units have the power to perform any function pertaining to its government and affairs. And that includes the power to regulate for the protection of the public health, safety, and welfare, and the power to license, to tax, and to incur debt. All that is given to any town that becomes home rule. And the statute, uh, the, the constitutional provision also says that the powers and functions of home rule units shall be construed liberally. So if there's an argument or a dispute, um, the, this, this is a direction to the courts to pr have a presumption in favor of, of the home rule community. But there are, oh, and th another thing that a home rule unit can do in section 6F is um, home rule units can alter the form of government, alter like the number of, uh, of, of trustees, go to nine trustees, for example, or nine member village board, eliminate a village clerk, uh, provide for managerial form. It could do all of that, but only by referendum. Non-home rule communities, um, except for the referendum for manager, uh, cannot even hold a referendum to change um, any part of the form of government. But this constitution is not without um, limitations. There are very specific limitations in the Illinois constitution that are imposed on home rule units. For example, even though it could incur debt, it can't incur long-term debt payable from the property tax. It can't use the property tax as collateral. Um, it cannot define or provide for the punishment of a felony. So we cannot create, or a home rule unit cannot create something and define it as a felony. Only the state can do that. It can't, um, in, in, if, if a home rule unit wanted to add a punishment for violation of one of its laws, it could, it could insert a fine or a penalty, but it can't uh, uh, allow for imprisonment for more than six months. Now, it cannot, it cannot create a tax, um, and it cannot create an income tax. Home rule units cannot create an income tax, and home rule units cannot create an occupation tax. All those are limitations built right into the Constitution. The other thing that the Constitution added um, as a limitation on home rule is that the state itself could preempt local governments. So when you're in the world of home rule, you hear about preemption. The state of Illinois has the ability to preempt home rule, ex the exercise of powers, even by home rule units. They can only do it if they um, adopt a statute by a super majority <clears throat> within the state legislature. And <clears throat> there is a provision in the, um, that, that now has been created through case law that says that the, um, that the state legislature, if they wanna preempt home rule, they have to do so explicitly. They have to have a, what we now call is the preemption clause. They have to have a clause in the statute that says this statute hereby preempts home rule. 
and then they're able to preempt. And, and state legislature has done that on many things, smoking bans, assault weapon bans, other, uh, there, there are many um, examples of the state preempting home rule or the, 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 the things that home rule units can do. When Nikki gives her presentation, you're going to get a much more much more specific examples of things that home rule units can do. That's the broadest. Um, uh, that's from a very I gave you provided you a very broad statement of what the Constitution says. In terms of becoming home rule, I indicated you can. It's automatic by population, and then the other um, method is by referendum. We'll get into the specifics of the referendum at the end of this. Uh, at the end of both of our presentation. Um, but I do want to note that once you are home rule, uh, either by population or by referendum, you can terminate um, home rule, but by <clears throat> referendum. So here we are um, today, by current count, according to a study by the Illinois Municipal League, there are 221 home rule municipalities in the state of Illinois. There is one and has only ever been one home rule county, and that's Cook County. It became by um, population. Other counties could become by referendum, but none have tried. Uh, some have tried and failed, um, but only Cook County is um, by referendum. I want to point out just because um, we've been following in Glencoe um, various home rules that recent that, that have adopted some of our neighbors, um, home rule, uh, Lake Forest, Lake Bluff, Winnetka, Bannockburn, Highwood, Riverwoods, and Northfield. Um, all of our contiguous communities are, are home rule um, at this time. But I point out those because several, many of the, for many years, Glencoe was in the company of these communities. Um, and, and, and we'll go through just a little bit of the Glencoe history. Um, we've parted company because these have all successfully become home rules. The only one who was in this club with Glencoe was Kenilworth, and Kenilworth is still not home rule. Um, but all these were part of our company. They've all gone on to become home rule. Yeah, it's a question. Sure, Joe. Is there a 30 second reason why what triggered this start in like in, in the northern communities in, in 04? Um, it seems like it all did. Yeah, it, it, it actually, several of them. And I'll go over Glencoe's history. Several of them were looking at it in, in the um, in the eighties and nineties, um, and there really wasn't anything that that caused the turn, but uh, just a series of failed attempts um, in the late nineties. Uh, and and the third time was the charm for many of these. The one thing that did happen that may have caused several to jump on board um, the the village. Of Northfield, which is not listed on here. Um, what? It was there. Oh, yeah. it wasn't Northfield. I think it was Lake Forest. Um, when it, after several unsuccessful attempts, Lake Forest um, adopted something that has been known, become known as home rule light. Um, all of these communities have had a series of failures of adopting home rule. Hope Lake Forest said, we'll adopt home rule. But before you go to vote, we're going to adopt an ordinance and impose on ourselves a limitation on the um, on our ability to raise taxes and our ability to incur debt. We're going to self-impose that. Um, that allowed Lake Forest to prevail. Um, and then I think Lake Bluff, Winnetka, um, both adopted that same approach. So it, it sort of had a, um, a follow me type of approach. Uh, Lenko looked at it, and I'll talk about that um, to, to do it itself. Though that is a an interesting concept. I'll note that it's an ordinance that can be adopted and repealed at any time. Um, it's it, it, it's it's more for show, uh, but it it obviously allowed some of these communities to get it passed in the ballot. Uh, in, in, a, in an election. Um, here's the most recent adopters of, of home rule. Um, you'll see a number of them on the list. The one that had been trying for many, many times is Barrington, and it just succeeded back in just, just a, um, two years ago uh, in, 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 a, in a referendum. We have all the materials 
or very good. I should note, uh, just in, in terms, I've personally been involved in many successes and many failures. A lot of those are on that list. So I've seen this from both sides. Um, and obviously you've been um, with Glencoe for a number of years through a lot of Glencoe's attempts. Um, I wanted to also note that there are a couple that already have put home rule on the ballot. Um, Carrie, Richton Park, and Roselle um, uh, are all considering home rule today. Um, we'll see where that goes. And then others um, I have considered it for the November um, election and then uh, possibly for the March election. Um, you see in, 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 in this very recent column, Lake Moore and Wakanda um, both failed in, in a referendum just this past year. Um, Kankakee voted to repeal it, but that vote failed, so they actually retained hope. All right, Glencoe. Glencoe's had an interesting history with home rule. Many of the people at this table have actually lived through it. Um, uh, so you better than I will be able to say it. I'm just going to give you a high-level uh, reminder. Uh, back in 1988, one of the first efforts um, to create a home rule in Glencoe, a home rule committee was formed more organically. Um, it was chaired by Ellen Schubart, who later it was before she became um, a, a trustee in the village. Um, it, it had both resident members and um, village officials. Elizabeth Warren, the then president, and Flo Boone, the past president, both were on this committee. Scott Feldman, who was a village trustee, was on this committee and very actively involved. I understand, um, but I didn't have it in any of my own records, that your current village president, Howard Rowan, may have been actively involved at the time. Um, that committee uh, pushed for a referendum that actually made it onto the ballot in November of 1988, and it failed by a large margin, almost three to one. Um, the issues, in, and Howard, you may be able to speak more to it, but affordable housing uh, weighed in, and um, it, there was just a, 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 a distrust at the time of having local officials govern the village. There was a greater um, trust in the leadership in Springfield at the time. That may have changed so, a little wait, wait, bit. Wait, wait. But so I, I was there. Um, we got cream. <laughs> uh, but it, it was a unique reason why we got cream back in India. And the reason, uh, for one, uh, although Flo Boone, uh, former village president, somehow shows up on that committee, she was opposed to home rule. Uh, the current president, the president at the time, president when I was on the board, was a woman named Betsy Warren. Betsy was for it. Um, when the new village board came in, when Bess became president, I, I became, I joined the board. We basically did away with what Flo Boone had been doing, which was not doing the infrastructure. And I think Flo was mad about her legacy. Uh, and so that was one thing. And she organized people. And the other thing, more important, was there was a guy named Harold Katz. Harold Katz was a longtime state representative under the old constitution. Um, and the old constitution was weird. There, you got, everybody got three votes um, and you could bullet vote your three votes or you could spread them around. Harold Katz, D. Glencoe got elected because he got bullet voted by some of the people in Glencoe. And so he was a Democrat, even though the entire North Shore was Republican. For whatever reason, um, Harold Katz, as a result of the new constitution, he was gone because the you know, he got one vote and so he couldn't get elected anymore. He was an opponent of home rule. But, but in 1988, so this is 18 years later, he's an old guy, but he's still sort of revered in Glencoe, D. Glencoe. Uh, he was against home rule. And his say-so caused um, 
sort of a groundswell of people that thought they were Glencoe to be against Glenwood. So the combination of Low Boon and the old timers and Harold Katz crushed us. Um, at the time, Glencoe was at the forefront. Nobody, you know, most of the North Shore villages were not home rule. Um, so we were doing something different. And like I said, we got cream. It's a little different now. We're now behind the times. Um, and Harold, and, and you know, I never really understood Harold Katz's idea. I mean, he, he just was against it. Uh, well, you know, he was a good public servant, but he's gone. Uh, so now it seems to me the playing field is very different. The reasons to do home. Wait, let me get let me get to you to now because we, okay. we we missed two thousand five. So I want to okay. uh, I want to just that, that that was fantastic. And I should add here this is a brochure from nineteen eighty eight, and Flo Boone is listed as a supporter. So she was like not. friends like this, you don't need enemies. So I, <laughs> she, was, she, she was not. Um, it, this information campaigns are not new. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So this is really good. Um, so failed in, two, in 1988. In 2005, um, one of the big advocates from 88 was now the village president, Scott Feldman. Scott Feldman appointed an 18-member task force uh, of all residents. No um, elected officials were on the task force. Um, it was chaired by Deborah Kogan. Howard Rowan was a member of the task force. Barbara Miller, who was recently on the village board, was a member of that task force. And it met for a year, from July of 2005 to June of 2006. And Harold Katz was very present at that point, too. Here is a memo that Harold Katz wrote in 2005, all reasons for not voting for home rule. Um, and uh, by the end of the um, service of this task force, there was a recommendation to the village board to adopt, to, 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 to put home rule on the ballot but only if it had the limitation <laughs> that um, Winnetka and um, Lake Forest and Lake Bluff um, had included. The village board considered it, didn't want to have that limitation. Um, and based on the uh, rather lukewarm uh, support from the committee, determined that it would not proceed any further with home rule. So it died at the village board level in 2005. In 2019, uh, I, I'm sorry, in 2015, um, the village board, in a meeting very much like this, asked the staff to start gathering um, information. The staff put together a, a memo that compiled all of the material from the 88 campaign and from 2005 and updated um, the, the village board, um, but the board determined not to direct any further staff time on the matter. So the matter died at a committee of the whole meeting. In 2019, the committee of the whole met again um, to listen to a presentation much like this. Um, there was discussion, not a lot of staff time incurred, but at the conclusion of the Committee of the Whole in late July, there was a desire to um, continue review. That got pushed to December. In, at a December Committee of the Whole, there were more questions raised and a desire for more questions to be answered by staff. Three months later, COVID hit and the matter died a slow death, um, not because of any direction to, to end it, but just because other things took priority. Steve, the only thing I would add, the, the nexus or the genesis for that final review uh, was a uh, notation in the strategic plan that um, the village should examine its governance structure. And uh, the, the discussions that began in 2019 were in response to that strategic plan uh, initiative. And so um, that brings us to today in our history lesson and our overview of, of, of home rule. Nikki's going to take it from here. I'm going to come back when we talk about logistics, if you want to go that far, meaning how to implement it if you're ready to do it in 2024.
Thank you. Thank you, Steve. So I'm going to take you down, some of you down memory lane, some of you may be hearing this for the first time. Um, included in the packet are links to all of the staff memos that were prepared in 2019 and 2020. Uh, before I kick off, I just want to recognize Sharon Tanner because she did a ton of work on this with me throughout 2019 to 2020. Um, so this is a little bit of the Groundhog Day for her. Um, but we we started, as Phil noted, um, and as Steve mentioned, the village derives all this legal tackling regulatory authority from the state and from the special charter. Um, this was part of the strategic plan discussions evaluating the village's authority as a non-home rule special charter community specifically focused on whether or not the village has the tools in its toolbox to respond to local issues in a timely manner. We focus these efforts specifically in three categories, um, the village's ability to regulate locally, um, provide economic development incentives, and then also what did it mean for the village from a financial perspective. Um, this was focused in 2019, and issues at the time were limitations on the village's uh, ability to legislate local issues, but we could not. Um, the ban of coal tar asphalt products was a big thing at the time that the village wanted to do, but we could not do because of our non home rule status. Regulating dangerous animals, whether that was an issue or not, I think we did have a local issue at that time. Uh, licensing and oversight of short-term home rentals and the ability to tailor an affordable housing plan for what would work for the village specifically. Um, those are just a, a sampling of the issues included in a series of memos and most recently this evening's memo is a detailed chart listing out a, a host of issues that were identified and the difference of what is available to the village as a home rule community versus what's available to the village as a non home rule community. Uh, also addressed in the memo were limitations on the manner in which the, the village could sell property. I think the board has also seen that um, we are limited in that we do have to get an appraisal or sell a property through a bidding process or an auction process. Uh, economic development programs are limited in what we are able to offer. If we start looking at opportunities in the downtown or potential relocation of the public works operations building, we are limited by state statute and the options that are available to develop those properties. Um, lastly, and you hear a lot about this when people talk about home rule, is the financial aspect of it. Um, and I'll go through that in a moment. But we talked about the village's financial authority as a non home rule unit. Most common discussion that you hear about with home rule is the property tax extension limitation law. Uh, the village is subject to that. That limits us to levying a property tax that is either the lower of CPI from the last 12 months, which has ironically been the highest in the past couple of years as it has been in the last 40, or 5%. You're capped at that 5%. Typically, what you will see with non home rule units of government is that they will levy up to that cap to make sure that they don't lose the compounding effect of the property tax levy year over year. Um, also missing from the village's current structure is the ability to implement home rule revenue that can shift tax burdens away from the property tax levy um, onto either visitors or non-residents. Uh, a few examples of that would be a tax clicker tax, amusement tax or impact fees um, and included in tonight's package is a much larger list of revenues that I won't go through at this point in time. So the discussion on home rule continued into July of 2019 as Steve mentioned. Um, the July 2019 committee, the whole meeting focused specifically on what Steve was referring to earlier of self limitations of home rule. Um, and those specifically that were identified and implemented by our surrounding municipalities. <clears throat> uh, using our neighbors as comparisons, um, we have seen that they've used their home rule authority to implement additional property maintenance codes, implement community specific zoning regulations, 
tailor affording affordable housing plans to their needs, their specific needs, um, and also implement local adjudication. Um, most recently, local adjudication is allowable. Um, and when I say that, I mean um, allowing us as a village to adjudicate violations of local ordinance. Sometimes I, I still think we can't do moving violations, right? No, well, no one can do moving. Uh, so there, but you are still limited to what is available in statute. So there is still kind of a limitation there. Conversation of home. Oh, I'm sorry. We can go back for one slide. Um, also discussed on the opposite end of not only just using <clears throat> home rule authority, but self limitations that were imposed in obtaining home rule status, as Steve was alluding to earlier. The communities of Lake Bluff, Lake Forest, Northfield, and Winnetka have all adopted their own version of self imposed limitations, promising the community that if they voted for home rule, that the village would, by ordinance, impose self limitations. The most common self limitation is self imposing that property tax extension limitation law. Uh, important to note, as Steve mentioned, that is adopted by ordinance, can easily be undone. Um, but with the home rule status, all of these communities also implemented alternate revenues to balance out the impact of the property tax cap. Um, and I'll just, sudden, just want to point out on that, of the 221 home rule units that exist today in Illinois, I, I know of only these, maybe five or six have that have this home rule light. It was a it was a thing, as, as Joe recognized in 2004. Uh, well, that's, a good, that's a good point. Um, all of these communities that adopted this home rule light, I like that, and adopt that phrase, um, all ex included exceptions for emergency situations or changes in state law. So even though they adopted these self-imposed limitations, they left themselves room to adjust if something in the environment changed. And those emergency exceptions have swallowed the rule in many instances. I would just let you know personal experience. Mm -hmm. Moving on through history, um, <clears throat> the next meeting that this was discussed at was the September 19th uh, Committee of the Whole, again in 2019. Uh, this was specifically focused on revenue uh, and the differences between home rule and non-home rule <clears throat> revenue sources. Um, these revenues that were identified, we tried to focus on a fair comparison of what revenues would be available to the village under the non-home rule status versus the home rule status. Uh, this is not by any means an exhaustive list. We picked the sampling to display to the board for consideration. Um, but the focus was on several fees that can shift the cost of municipal services from residents to visitors and non-residents and help lessen that burden on the property tax bill. Uh, that, as I mentioned earlier, that included packaged liquor tax, amusement tax, additional sales taxes, Right now, the village could implement a non-home rule sales tax that is capped at 1%. Um, under a home rule situation structure, you have much more flexibility. Also something for future consideration as we talk about potential for development or just thinking long-term down the road, a hotel motel tax would be something that would be available to us as a home rule community that revenue can be spent on anything. There's a non-home rule that's subject to much more limitation. Um, there's also an opportunity to adjust user fees for impacts, such as a stormwater fee that would directly fund our stormwater program. Right now, it's just whatever funds are available in the general fund. So this would provide a uh, direct correlation between those that have the greatest impact on the stormwater system to the improvements that need to be made. Um, the other side of the coin on this, aside from revenue, are limitations on debt issuance. And Steve touched on this in his presentation, and all of you that have been on the board now, you've seen the process and you understand the limitations that we are subject to. Uh, because the village has to go out to referendum to issue general obligation bonds, we're limited to 
election cycles or the constraints of election cycles of when we can issue general obligation debt. Also limited to the approval of the community when we do that. There are opportunities to issue debt without a referendum as we have done, limited tax debt, um, alternate revenue bond debt that would be sub, uh, supported by water revenue. Uh, but typically those bonds will come with a higher interest rate because there's a greater risk. When you issue general obligation bonds that comes with the full faith and credit of the village, it's backed by property tax bills, which is why we have to ask resident permission to issue those. But that also comes with a lower cost of borrowing and yields a greater amount of capital improvements that you can fund with those bonds. Um, that difference between a revenue bond and a general obligation bond can add up to six figures very quickly over the term of the bond um, because of that full faith and credit piece of the village. Um, our overall debt issuance is limited to 8.8% of our EAV as a non-home rule unit. That's not the same in, in a home rule environment. Um, not suggesting that we go there, but it is something to be noted. The other piece is that the village is also limited in the term of the debt that it can issue. As a non-home rule unit, we cannot borrow longer than 20 years. When you think about that in terms of a mortgage, um, it doesn't sound like that long, but when you think of that in terms of a street improvement or a water main, some of which are 50 years plus, aging infrastructure, when you think about kind of match the matching principle in accounting, you want to match those benefits of an improvement to the repayment and those folks that are benefiting from that improvement. We can't do that in this scenario. And we've talked about that also with the golf course that we were limited with a 20 year term as a non home owner. Um, again, overall theme of the financial impact was we have some limitations in the speed in which the village can react. Um, in the wild interest rate environment that we have been in over the past several years, we've also seen that. Um, to do a general obligation bond issue, you're generally in a timeline of three months from start to finish of getting that done from initiating the bond issue to closing to bond proceeds. When you add the election cycle in there, you're looking at six months lead time. And for those of you that are working with investments on a regular basis, there can be a pretty wild swing in the market in a six month time frame. So that does constrain us in terms of planning for a long term investment in the community and what we can afford and how quickly we can react to the market. <clears throat> The conversation continued in January of 2020. This was focused on reviewing the results from the village's community survey in 2019. There was a specific focus on five questions that were geared towards evaluating the community's reaction to enhancing the village board's authority to legislate locally. On all five of these questions, um, it yielded answers from the community of agreement or strong agreement, ranging from 37 to 58%, um, generally in support of, as opposed to what Steve was alluding to earlier, a stronger faith in the state government, leaning more towards having a greater faith in the local <clears throat> government controlling um, local issues. In addition, a review of the open-ended response from the community survey indicated a lot of interest from the community in addressing local issues, all related to home rule authority. That included ensuring long-term financial sustainability, the management of property tax increases, implementing fee structures that were not related to the property tax bill, enhancing the oversight of residential property tax make, or property maintenance, and encouraging commercial development throughout the community. And, and those that were here on the board in 2020 can certainly take a victory lap. But as we've seen, there's the other big thing that occurred is a huge lack of distrust with all that's going on down in Springfield and the state legislative officials. That's a com good combination. Mm -hmm. As you mentioned, uh, <clears throat> oh, no, you're right. You're good. Thank you. Um, 
in August 2020, that marked the final discussion um, with the village board uh, at the committee as a whole regarding home rule versus non home rule governance. Um, this meeting was focused on recapping the four previous meetings and all the information that had been gathered. Um, as Steve noted, the consensus of the board at the time was generally to table the issue. There was a lot of uncertainty still around COVID-19 and what that was going to mean for us financially. Um, I think there was concerns about folks getting out to the polls in a COVID-19 environment at that time, and we have not talked about this since. And that meeting itself was a virtual meeting. Yes. Um, that brings us today to today. Uh, which finds the village grappling with many of the same issues that we were discussing in 2019. Um, we're still navigating limited timelines for borrowing uh, core capital improvements. Uh, we're limited in administering certain zoning changes. Um, we're limited in implementing diversified revenue streams that may be able to shift the tax burden away from our residential base. Um, we're restricted on implementing purchasing contracts that extend beyond the village president's timeline, um, which doesn't sound like a big deal until you start thinking about our ability to contract on multi-year contracts, lock in pricing, participate in certain purchasing cooperatives. That does translate to real dollar savings. Um, we're still grappling with the inability to le legislate local issues. Um, Glencoe is in a unique um, position. I don't know if you'd call us lucky, uh, but not only are we limited by state legislation, we are also limited by being within Cook County, the only home rule county in Illinois. So not only are we grappling with the state, whether they're mandating items to us, or waiting for the state to pass something to address an issue that is important to us locally, we're also subject to the same uh, restrictions on the county side. We saw this with the Cook County minimum wage ordinance. We did not have the ability to opt out of that. And we also recently saw this for the Paid Leave for All Workers Act, in which we tried to react and still we could not out opt out of the state legislation uh, or the Cook County one. Um, we're also subject to limitations on the promotional process for public safety officers. Home rule units just have more flexibility than we do, again, because you're, you're stuck uh, with what is in the state law within the Illinois Municipal Code. As part of the research for this evening, uh, we continued a little bit more research. Um, Staff hold historical property tax revenue for a relatively modest home in Grand Co. Um, I would caveat this as you're looking at these property tax amounts. This is only the municipal portion of the bill. So if you're looking at that going, my property tax bill is not higher. This is just focused on the impact from the municipality. And we pulled data from a comparable property for all, from all of our home rule neighbors and looked at a nine year history. And when you look at this chart, I know it's tiny on the screen, it's much larger in the packet. You can see that Glen comes towards the top of the chart. And what this alludes to is that the practice of being solely reliant or so reliant on the property tax levy is that by comparison, that actually puts Glencoe at the higher end of a property tax bill rather than the lower end because what's missing from our equation is the ability to implement revenues that shift that property tax burden. So when you hear folks talk about home rules and implementation of home rule and thinking that that translates to a higher property tax bill, the truth is actually to the contrary because we have that reliance. So this concludes our formal presentation. We'd like to hear the board's thoughts on um, the information that's been presented this evening. We'd be happy to answer any questions that you have. Um, there are several options for the, the committee to direct staff from this point. Um, if there's any additional research that you'd like us to conduct, obviously we're happy to help facilitate that for you. If you'd like to hear us stop talking <laughs> and just be done, also happy to do that as well. Uh, and then as Steve alluded to, if, if the board is interested in pursuing a referendum, there are two ways that that can happen. 
um, that we can discuss that if you'd like to go. Those down are there. the next two slides. We can finish it or we can hear what you have to say and then show you those two slides. So let's, let's talk about this for a second. So let me say thank you to our presenters. This was really helpful. Um, gets us to the point where we can decide whether we're interested in this. Um, let me disclose if it wasn't obvious already that I'm not, you know, this isn't my first rodeo in this. I have a record. Um, I was for home rule um, in 1988 when we went down in flames. One, one of the reasons I was for home rule doesn't apply anymore, so I want to disclose that. At the time, um, you, you still have the salt limitation, the famous salt limitation. And a, a, at the time, the villages could get around all the tax caps by just moving to fees. So a lot of people say, well, we're just moving to fees. And that was sort of obviously harmful to the residents, except for the wealthiest residents with the biggest houses, because the village would move to fees and then you wouldn't get tax deduction, whereas with property taxes, you get big tax deduction. That is no longer true. So that's not a, you know, maybe it'll become true again. We'll see, it doesn't look like it. So that's a, that's one reason that I was for home rule at gunpoint. However, most of the reasons that I was for home rule back in 1988 still apply. And I, and I think we have more fertile ground now because all, virtually all of our neighbors have seen the wisdom of this. And it's pretty hard to explain why um, we're an outlier, particularly in light of Nikki's chart that shows that being an outlier has not resulted in lower property taxes for our residents. Um, when I ran for president, uh, somebody on the caucus asked me whether I had a position on home rule. Um, I said, you know, yes, I did. It's easy for anybody to find. I was in favor of it. And my principal, there are a lot of reasons, but my principal reason is there, there are serious arguments against home rule, but they're all theoretical. There's a theory that if given home rule, this group or some successor group will lose our minds and engage in some wild project that mortgages the future of the village forever. And that's a theory. And people who are particularly afraid of what government can do can support that theory. There is no evidence in the real world just looking around to support that theory. But that's a theory, and you're going to hear it. The flip side is that every day our residents are spending more money than the residents of other communities because we're not home rule. So by not being it just as an end, by not being home ruled, um, we cannot take advantage of advice on when to do bonds. So all these experts will tell you, here's the time, get in the market, do it. We don't get to do that because by the time we've gotten around to it and passed our referendum, we get to pay more, or at least we can't take advantage of benefits. Because we're not home rule, we get to pay for our 40 and 50 year improvements over 20 years, which means that the current residents get the lucky opportunity to pay more than other folks. Um, every time we want to do anything, we have to consult our lawyers. We love our lawyers, they're great guys, but his kids have already gone to college and they do not need the extra large S because every time we want to sneeze, we have to find out if it's legal. Or there, find a creative way or around a creative it, way around it, which isn't number. free either. So uh, the bottom line is, on the one hand, there's a theory that our village board may go nuts, but on the but you know why would we? I mean, you know, 
purchased here because we want to do streets and sewers and make it a nice village for our residents. And then there's the reality that with the handcuffs we have, everything we request our residents for. I believe now, with you know, taking the time that we can explain this to our residents, in part because, it, I, and I don't know, I never understood Harold, he was, you know, he was an esteemed guy. Home rule was created at the day, on the day that his ability to be a state legislator ended. And he was done. Now, was he mad? I don't know what he's mad about. Whatever it was, you know, <clears throat> Steve Guy certainly whipped my ass back in the day, but he's no longer around uh, and nobody's going to do any. So I think it would be better for the village. I disclosed this when I ran. Nobody threw me out. Uh, this, the caucus invited the presidents of the park board and the library board talked with them on January 31st. And they said, tell us what you're going to do in the next year. And so I thought, you know, we're going to do infrastructure. And one of the things I said is that I had not spoken to any of the board members about this, but that I thought we should look at home rule because um, it would be a good thing to do. I continue to think that. I would note that every village president since Lobu, every single one has, uh, not a fool went wild, has supported home rule. I would note that every village around us that has looked at it has supported home rule without falling into the lake. Um, it's time. It's time for us to do it. Um, yeah. And, you know, I think we should have a referendum. We'll have to think about whether it's most appropriate. You know, we're going to need to make sure the village is ready. I don't know whether that should be November or next March or when, but, uh, you know, let's do it so the residents of the village can start benefiting from this sensible reform and can start saving money. Anyway, that's my spiel. So when you go back to the past, 1988's dust bugs, I mean, I think in every single one of those, uh, affordable housing was one of the key issues. And someone refreshed us as to what exactly the affordable housing issue was and possibly <clears throat> continues to be. There was a there was a thought. Um it is since well, there was a thought and a theory that um Home rule units <clears throat> could could exempt themselves from the affordable housing requirements that may be imposed by the state, and um, there was a theory in Glencoe. It, it, they went two different directions. Some strongly supporting home rule, and some strongly opposing. Some strongly, I'm sorry, supporting affordable housing and some opposing affordable housing. The one thing that they both agreed on was that home rule wouldn't wouldn't be good. The those that supported home rule, uh, those that support affordable housing, were concerned that if Glencoe became home rule, it would exercise that authority as several other home rule communities have done to take them out of the state of Illinois mandates for affordable housing. And those that opposed affordable housing were concerned that if Glencoe became home rule, it would adopt some sort of creative affordable housing program for itself. So it was it was just like a an, an interesting intersection of, of um, those that supported and disliked affordable housing they both found themselves on the same side of opposing home rule. Today, it is more difficult for home rule unit to exempt themselves out of the state mandate. Um, there's creative arguments, but the state has closed that gap. Thank you. Thank you.
I just have a question on the bond insurances. And I just have a vague recollection of 1988 and my father being concerned that the village. You were five. <laughs> Don't rub it in. Yeah, I just moved back to Blanco. But, uh, but anyway, that he was concerned about, you know, the village board and the authority to do this, the bond issuance. And I don't know, you know, I. Didn't they hear that being a big concern then? Under any of the um, home rule light scenarios, did any of them adopt any kind of limitations at all on boundary changes? Yeah, no, they did. Um, one of the home rule light was you won't issue a bond without a referendum, meaning just put it right back to where. Oh, so then it was like no. So then you're not like not having home rule. That was one of the scenarios. When that did it just by a policy, they said that they wouldn't, but they they did. I think it was, there was there were thresholds. There were, if it were if there was an issuance over a certain amount, That's, that there would be uh, either an advisory referendum or some level of public engagement relative to that action before it took place. Uh, I think there's a practicality question that goes along with that, right? Um, and so, I, 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 as Steve said, some have been imposed and then adjusted as as time went on. Uh, but I do think that there, the intention behind it was that it wasn't for everything, but that it would be if if there was if there was a certain threshold that would be passed, that that would go through a an added engagement process. The argument, and I'll just put it on the table, because if you do go forward, you'll hear it here, I'm sure, <clears throat> in those towns was, look, there's never been a bond referendum that we as the taxpayers haven't approved. So why do you need home rule? Just keep giving us, um, uh, just keep putting a referendum for us and we'll approve it. Um, and that that likely will be something that someone will say if you do move forward in Glento. The argument on the other side is the timing. I mean, we can't, as, as the Bill's president said, we, we won't be able to take advantage of certain um, bond of, of market opportunities if we have to go to the referendum. Result of the same, but sometimes the timing is it puts you, it gives you a significant setback and the term. And I think people nowadays understand that they're probably a little more tuned into that because of the outdoor yes. markets. Yeah, so I was on the board back in 2019 when we considered that it might be a good idea. I think all the same reasons that we considered in 2019 are relevant in 2020. You're all sick and tired of hearing from me about how much I am in favor of home rule, so I won't belabor it. But for all the very well stated reasons, um, definitely financially and trying to limit the burden on our own taxpayers of what it costs to run the place and run it well. Uh, but also, we see more and more examples come up all the time. Sometimes simple things that you would like to do, something with a zoning ordinance or otherwise, and you're like, no, nope, you can't. No, you're limited. You can't do it that way, even though we think it would make sense and be nice and good for our residents. And it just keeps coming up over and over again. Like I said, at the beginning, you know my I just want to add, I, you know, I think the Thank you for your presentation. Everybody thanks for all the work. So I really appreciate it. Um, I think um, as long as we have the resources and the time to uh, share all that we can learn to the public, and we can whatever decide which election day, November, April, day, whatever day we want to um, identify as the date that we would go to refer the referendum to decide on this. I mean, I think we have the day we have to let it. Our, our meeting mm -hmm. side. So it's as long as we can get the word out as as much as we can and every you know every medium that we can use um, and we can educate the public, I think we have nothing really to lose, especially noting all the benefits that were mentioned here. So.
sure Steve will, will give us chapter and verse on this, but it's an interesting concept. We can advocate for the referendum to say, okay, now it's going to be a referendum. We passed an ordinance. We know it's going to referendum. We can't advocate for its passive. We can educate. That's, that's what I'm saying. But educate is what I'm trying to say. Yes. Uh, educate as much as we can. Pros and cons. I'll just fact chapter. I mean, fact, factual information. Yeah. I just want to add my statement that it gives us more tools in our tour kit, tool kit and, and uh, I think we really should go ahead with it. I agree. Make sure we have good communication. Okay. I guess I only add is uh, that, that that contingent group that was uh, unhappy with uh, President Levin and the uh, the water contractor or consulting that group's still out there. So I I don't know if that's something we're discussing here, but again. There's a communications effort I think that we need to be, and we should be conscious of why this was so unpopular 10 years ago. To address that slightly, it wasn't so much the home rule conversation that was unpopular 10 years ago, but that there were words used in the conversation around options or opportunities with the water plant and actions that the village could utilize uh, at that time and the words that were used were eminent domain. I would make note that regardless of the village's home rule or non-home rule status, the ability to utilize eminent domain for certain things remains at our disposal. So let me, let me say that same thing, but turn it around. Becoming home rule does not enhance or change eminent domain authority. It, the same rules apply, the same <clears throat> procedural processes, the same constitutional requirement of fair market value and, and public purpose all apply to home rule units in the same way they do apply to non-home rule units. So you don't enhance your ability to acquire by eminent domain by achieving home rule. It's a good point. To the extent people that were involved with the farms misunderstood that, that's part of the educational process. You know, there's a lot of things people think they know about home rule that are not so. Well, I think too, you're just looking at that, that last, people only remember numbers and stories. That last slide uh -huh. is, is something that needs to be. Yeah. That's 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 really hard. Yeah. 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 This is the slide that shows the property tax. Yeah. 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 Right, because it, it it's the old story. Oh, if I don't max it out, then I'm leaving. I won't have the dollars later. I can never go back and get them. If I have more flexibility and I don't need the money, I don't have to be. I don't have to. Get it and put it in the piggy bank. I can leave it in the taxpayer. Yeah, we have a booming downtown and hopefully some great plans from the planning commission to make it even better. And it seems like that's a wonderful opportunity, right? To look at look at revenues to come. So, Mr. President, there are still two big issues. So the question is: Okay, <laughs> how, <laughs> when? And you know, so let's hear about the what's... how and the when are still um, big open questions. There's two ways, as I told you, <clears throat> there's two ways to become home rule. That's by referendum or population. Unless you have some plans to grow, <laughs> uh, you're you're limited to referendum. Um, <laughs> now there are um, two ways to get it on the refer to get um, something on a referendum. So I'm going to interrupt and say there is the open space, the Hoover Estate. <laughs> but it's hard to see how we squeeze in 47 stories. 12,000 people or 15,000 people. You'd have an easier 16, time annexing Norfolk. <laughs> um, We're going to invade whatever. So, um, <laughs> the, you'll recall those of you who were around for the, um, the uh, 
golf course uh, referendum, you'll know that I advised then there were two ways to get that matter on the referendum. One was by a resident petition and the other is by village board resolution. The resident petition has to have uh, signatures by 8% of the votes cast in the last election, in the votes cast in, in Glencoe in the last gubernatorial election. I don't know what that number would be. I but, don't either. Um, yeah, top of my the and easier way. The total number of votes for both, for all candidates. Total number from both sides. Um, the easier way would be by village board resolution, which is how you did the uh, golf course referendum. Uh, and it's just a simple resolution by a majority vote of the village board. Um, and then, so that's, that's how. Um, the next question is when. It would have to be at either the general election, which is in November 5th of 24 of this year, or the next consolidated municipal election, which is April 1 of 25. Um, if you want to go it, um, do it for the November 5th election, then the resolution has to be adopted by August 18th of this year. If you want to do it for the April 1 consolidated election, April 1, 25, then the resolution has to be adopted by January 12th of 2025. So these are your two dates of when, um, and now there are various strategies as to which election to be on. You'll recall that the um, general election of uh, in November will have the president and the governor on the ballot. The election in April will have um, several trustees and the village president on the ballot. Well, we get a bigger turn. By the way, the governor just got elected, so he's not going to be on the bill. Um, but uh, is that right? Yes, yeah. he just got elected, so it won't be him. So a senator, we have a Senator Duckworth. His seat is open, as well as um, the president. You're right. Um, so and state's attorney. Uh, so I really would like this to pass, but I don't want it to pass because we were strategic the way the folks in Ohio thought they could slip by the abortion thing by making an election when nobody's going to vote. So if all things being equal, <clears throat> most people, way more people from Glencoe will vote in November than will vote in April because they're just not as excited about these often uncontested elections. Um, so if I had my brothers, because I think I think it's just the right thing to do, let as many people in Glencoe vote, uh, I would be inclined to be in favor of November. Now that the only downside is that's a you know a shorter period of time for the village uh, to get Zach together to make sure we've educated our residents. If I had my druthers, I would say, let's give our residents a chance to weigh in on this. And that would mean. <clears throat> I guess I'm not a strategist, so I, I have no idea. I'm not a political consultant. My fear is that everybody is voting in the presidential election. They may not be informed. And I'm very concerned about people just flippantly checking yes or no, whereas if the election was in April. The people who would come would have been educated. They would have feelings one way or another. I, I always worry about people going to the ballot box and looking at judges' names and just checking, you know, a name because they have no idea and they're they're not informed. And the same thing with referendum questions. Um, so that would be my reason for thinking about a spring election. Is there any reason why we wouldn't consider the resident petition? Does anyone have? Can you guys get the numbers so that we know really what that means in terms of the? I mean, is that ill advised? It seems to me it might be a good way to build consensus. Um, it, it is. It's 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 an extra step in a long process, um, but it requires a. A, a significant grassroots effort. It's not easy to 
it, I mean, you may have needed to get uh, signatures on a petition for your own election. It's just not easy to to get that accomplished. I from experience and uh, uh, and it's become more difficult these days, as I've learned uh, in the post COVID era, where fewer people are taking the train. I mean, the train station was a big place to get. There was few. It's just it's it's not as easy to get and find people gathered together. And from a practical standpoint, it's also subject to one more layer of challenge. Um, if there are dedicated opponents to home rule, um, there's an ability to do an electoral challenge to the signatures, and uh, people just also are in general less likely to sign things anymore. They're worried about what they're putting there anymore. But having a citizen group, as you did with the, as existed, and someone say you did, as as existed with the golf course referendum, <clears throat> is probably very advisable um, in in. in getting the information out and education out. And while they may not necessarily need to be gathering signatures, they uh, forming of this group is a good idea for um, for the referendum in any event. Let, let me just say I take Gail's point really seriously, particularly because you know we lost once on a month gap. And again, I, I don't remember Back in '88, whether it was a was uh, in November, it was, it was in November. Yeah. Okay, so the so presidential, so you know, um, but and the board did adopt a resolution. Yeah, yeah. If, if you know, if people who know about this and oh yeah, you know, you're just automatically doomed because everybody's going to vote no the way they vote no on judges just because why not. Um, I hope that isn't so, and I do like the idea of having, you know, we're putting this to our residents. We're not hiding. I don't want to hide from this. Um, and I think the case can be made, which before we vote, we're doing a referendum, um, before we do that, I think, you know, we should make the case that we think we can persuade our friends and neighbors, that this is a good idea. It's a good, again, it's not charity. It's, a, it's not theory. It's a good idea for you going forward. So they'll want to vote yes. Um, what do you have an idea of what our public outreach plans will like even look like? Is it? Yeah. Well, we, yeah, to some degree. I mean, we've talked a bit about it. I think <clears throat> it will include a series of public meetings it would and not necessarily a meeting like a village board meeting but an open house um come and learn about this subject um we have a good model that we can review and what barrington was able to do in their most recent uh attempt at home rule i think this was their third um uh, third try and um they actually had a very strong approval. I think it was uh, over 60% voted in favor of it. So um, I would anticipate a series of things. Now keep in mind, as has been mentioned, you know, the village will be limited to some degree in materials that it can produce and share and mail and the costs to do so. Um, I think we wanna be very conscious of that. And I can't speak to the specifics as to how that would play out, but we would want to be mindful of that, um, taking into account the best way of developing information and sharing that information, utilizing the tools that we have available to us. So I would anticipate a, you know, a, a web page on the village's website that would be focused on this, that would include many of the pieces of information that we already have, may include um, hypothetical scenarios, right? If this then, um, and we've seen those types of things in Barrington and elsewhere, um, I would anticipate we would utilize our social media presence to get information into the hands of our residents. Um, I think to Steve's point, uh, I would hope that there would, if there, this is something that is important to groups in our community, that those groups would likewise find ways to share information um, that either the village produces or that they were, um, deriving based off of what the village has put out there. So a uh, multi-tiered, multi-factor timeline, I think is also important. 
Um, too much too soon means something gets forgotten. Um, I think depending upon the election cycle that the board ultimately chooses um, to, to look at, uh, we would be we would want to be mindful of that, and I think we'd work backwards from that date. Um, I would just make note of the fact that there are the two dates that were that are up there relative to when the board has to take action. Those aren't board meeting dates. Um, in if if we're looking at um, the November election, that would be the August fifteenth village board meeting is the last scheduled meeting. And if we're looking at uh, April, it would actually be the December 19th board meeting. So um, I think we, we would want to be mindful of that because at that point, particularly, there is a very specific amount of what the village is able to do uh, once that action of the village board has, has been taken. So um, it may be that we're uh, engaging the public um, well before the village board <coughs> takes action and the village board takes that information that's been derived from those public outreach efforts to make a determination about whether now is the right time, whether it's not, whether there's more information that we need to generate. So I, I would I think there's a lot of work that can be done that has not been done yet because we wanted to have this conversation, but that's something we can easily assemble and and uh, and get to work on. Uh, let me mention one thing. In addition to Barrington, which we all have to learn about, it was not obvious that the golf referendum was going to pass. And in many ways, that seems like kind of a harder sell. So I, I would want to go to school on what the folks that, that you know was not primarily the village board. What did they do? To, to get sort of the groundswell support for something that seems to me like a harder sell. Um, spending and, money versus saving money? Yeah. As, as spending money, I mean, the, the pitch against the golf referendum, as I understood it, was why exactly do I want to spend a boatload of money on a golf course I don't use? And, you know, that's pretty good. And I've heard very serious people say it. It nevertheless passed. Um, so I, you know, I, I think we should go to the people that supported that. And okay, what did you do? Now, one thing they did, Gail, is they didn't do it on a general election. They did it at a municipal election. And they election. had a twenty percent vote turn. Right. So that's, that's no question. No question. And so, so we'll have to get advice on that. But I, we should go to them. And I think. Probably a lot of the people that supported the golf referendum have a view of the village and what the village can and should do that is compatible with. But what, well, like I said, we have to figure this out. And I, I would want to talk to some of those folks sooner rather than later so we can answer the question about whether my theory about big election, which is, I, I just don't want us to look like we're, we're being cute the way they were in the high. I want to be the opposite of that, because we're not, the goal is not to throw a fastball past our residents. That is not the goal. Um, but let's, you know, let's get some answers and find out, and then we can, you know, we, uh, we can, you know, decide what to do with the place. And would we also consider submitting this decision earlier than the 92 days? That just seems rushed to me. I mean, I'd rather come oh, out that's with the our, end. That's the last thing. Right. Yeah, and yeah. I'd rather that's come out last. with our best foot forward rather than yeah. kind of testing the waters. Do people no, want this? Do they right. not? I mean, I, we're good, we're good. So I, I, I would say it would be when the board makes the decision that it wants to move forward is when you would do so. All I'm saying is that's the last date that you have a scheduled meeting. The one other point that I wanted to make is we have a slide that shows what the wording of the referendum is going to be. We don't, that's not that important. What is important is, um, and Gary alluded to it, is, is campaign which is absolutely not allowed. We can't use village resources to advocate to say vote yes or vote no, um, but we can educate and we can put together materials um, about 
the benefits of home rule uh, that may look like we're advocating, but we're simply telling the benefits of home rule. That's something that the village can do. Those success stories that, that I've witnessed have always had some citizen group um, that have led the charge. They have no restrictions on them. They can campaign. They can advocate as though they were pushing for a candidate um, that wouldn't be sponsored by the village, that wouldn't be paid for by the village, that wouldn't be appointed by the village. But to the extent that there are those out there that are interested, that's the most effective way of getting this done, putting them together and having them work in this. So can <clears throat> members of the village board advocate? It, 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 it's a really gray line. Members of, village, of the village board can be part of this group um, as individuals. You have First Amendment rights. Um, the line gets very gray when it, to determine whether you're acting on behalf of the village or not. There were just cases that, was, that were decided the other day in the United States Supreme Court about using your social media um, and, and whether you're a state actor, meaning whether you're acting on behalf of the government or not. And, and the court came out with a test. Um, that test is, is is kind of gray. You know, I, I could argue it on either side. So I'd be very, very careful um, about taking a strong position, even as strong as you were in today's meeting. Um, maybe uh, tough once this is on the, on and the it referendum. And maybe a separate standard for a village president versus a president and individual president. And, and I would think that <clears throat> what we referred to today, um, the 1988 um, information um, electioneering laws have shifted since that point. Even since time. then. So those, the fact that there were sitting trustees that were listed on the supporter list, mm -hmm. I would not anticipate oh. yeah. uh, is a option in 2024. Yeah. It, it would be well advised to see if there's a citizen group that, that could yeah. take on that burden. Right. Yeah. So, and likely, President, you know, I, one of the things I learned when I went to Steve's school, my friend that I started yeah. being president was, as president, I can do a bunch of stuff, whereas individual board members have to act as a group. So, so that was, Steve, that's your point about that's how exactly the rules, point. The rules would, would, I would be more limited to the rest of the group. Yeah, okay. Yeah. But none of this, I mean, everybody on the village board back in 88 supported this uh, and advocated with wrote letters to the editor. And, you know, it was just not somehow the world has changed. It is. It's changed a little bit. Okay. And trustee Scott, point your, your question about what is the difference between a citizen vote is that when you're debating whether to put this on to uh, to adopt a resolution when you're discussing that that is a chance where you can use the bully pulpit to advocate for this especially if you're unified and then when you vote that is that is a, a ratification and statement of your support of this. Okay. okay anybody else have any i mean we have uh, what i sense is the group thinks we should ask our residents about home rule, I think the group pre putting it to a referendum would like to persuade our residents why they should be in favor of this. Um, so I think what we should be looking at is, okay, when is the best way to do this so that our residents have a fair shot to weigh in and so that um, both sides have a chance to make their point. And you know, it's it remains an open question whether that is November or that is April, or even is it the following November, <clears throat> although I can't see waiting that long. I, yeah, I just don't yeah, I'm not sure there's even an election. Yeah, I, mean, I was gonna say what are we I think we'd be waiting for the primary in twenty six yeah. oh, so two years from so, now. So you know what that's what we go with. Yeah, that that's it's, it's we should, from my point of view, 
every day our residents get to pay extra for the theory that this is a bad idea. And I think it would benefit our residents to stop paying extra as soon as possible. How do we uh, take the temperature of our electors? You know, oh. start with, you know, we'll start talking about it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I think, to, I don't mean, I'm sorry, I don't mean to cut you off. I, one thing I, I would add, and then I, I'll get out of the way. Um, you know, we've had this information on the village's website for a long time. We talked about it a lot in 2019. Dan wrote several articles about it back then. Um, we talked about it quite a bit, even in 2020, amidst all of, mm -hmm. of COVID. And um, I was talking to Howard about this this afternoon. I think um, part of what we wanted to do tonight was to kind of get a sense of whether we're ready to start talking about it with the public more directly as we had been in 2019 and 2020. Um, I think based on the feedback that we're all hearing tonight, um, I think the opportunity for us is to begin that process again. And as soon as this Friday, when we when we push out our you know electronic newsletter and social media posts, uh, I would anticipate you know articulating what this meeting was about, what was discussed, um, what is the village board contemplating in terms of timelines, and um, what does this mean. Um, I think that is a message that we can't get a sense of how the community feels until they know, they know about we're it. talking about yeah, it. And it's, and it's hard as we try when we push agendas and just agenda packets out for people to take that, open it, read it. They're not necessarily doing that. They've got a lot going on in their lives. So now with this discussion tonight, I think we have a good opportunity to say, here's the YouTube link to the meeting. Watch it, take a look, hear what was presented, hear the comments that were shared. And um, there's gonna be more information coming as we as we move through this. But I would say that's our first step is this week, beginning to share that information out. I'm sorry. No, it's, I'm not necessarily, I'm not wild about doing a survey. You know, so. <laughs> became part because you know until somebody's been educated about it, it exactly okay. okay well then thank you for the really excellent presentations which helps us all get to, up to speed thanks to the trustees who read this stuff in advance so we know a little bit what it's about um let's start Okay. Um, is there anything else uh, there isn't? Um, anybody have any other business they want to talk about? Okay, then the um, next item is adjourned. Is there a motion to adjourn? Motion to adjourn. There are seconds. Second. All in favor? Aye. We are adjourned. Thank you.